Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Kim Roots from TV Line. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce actors Elizabeth Moss and Jamie Bell of Shining Girls. Hey, guys. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hey. Thank you so much for having us. Um, so I do not pretend to know exactly whatever, like the order of things in Shining Girls. All I know is that like by halfway through, sorry, Jamie, I just want Harper to go down. I just want him. I want him down and done, um, which I so let's get into like how you start creating a world that is constantly shifting. Elizabeth, I'm going to start with you. Um, Silka Luisa created the series based on Lauren Buke's book. Um, you came on relatively early, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And you're an executive producer and director as well as the star. So talk to me a little bit about looking at this crazy shifting reality realities um, that Kirby has in this story and like what you're thinking as you're reading these scripts and thinking about how this is going to play out on TV. Yeah, I think the thing that was the most important to us was to try to do it uh, as realistically as possible and to do it as in camera as possible, which was much harder. Um, VFX has gotten so good now that you can, you know, you can do so much. You can create an entire image that's completely digital. Um, but we wanted it to feel more um, visceral and we wanted it to feel like it was from Kirby's point of view or from Harper's point of view. We wanted it to really feel like it was it was really happening and kind of have a lo-fi kind of feel to it. Um, so that was something we discussed really early on and the challenge was set up for Michelle first as our as our director of the first two episodes to figure out how to do that her and her DP Rob um so they they had the work they had the hardest part which was figuring out how to do that and then Dana and I came in and and um took what they had kind of discussed and and ran with it um but those were the hardest uh scenes to do uh Dana had a big one where Kirby's hair is changing and things are changing behind her. And I had a big one that I directed in five with Jamie. Um, that was the hardest scene I've ever directed. And I haven't directed a whole lot, but it was the hardest thing I've ever done because doing these shifts is just really messes with your mind. <laughs> For real. And, and Jamie, over to you, like you hear about this time traveling serial killer and you're like, I, I, this is a guy I have to play. <laughs> like I'm in. Talk to me a little bit about what appealed um, to you about Harper, what you thought like you could bring to to the performance. I mean, I, I think Lauren um, wrote a great book, uh, which is just a wonderful foundation for a character, especially for an actor when there's already a piece of material that you can kind of just dig into and, and basically steal things from, <laughs> which is what I did. Um, it's such a great starting point, but then getting the the, the script from uh, Silka and the preceding scripts and the uh, speaking with Michelle and, and, and Silka and, and just hearing more about who he is and what he's like and why he is the way he is and why he does the way, why he does the things that he does. Um, they, they're kind of like, I, they kind of just started talking to me about latter episodes because I was kind of only sent the first couple, really, because I think the, the other ones weren't particularly finished or they had an outline or something. But I was, I'm so intrigued by these kinds of characters. I think we all are kind of as a culture, weirdly. I think we're, tr we're trying to put our finger on why these things happen, what motivates these kinds of people to do these kind of awful things that we would never do. Um, so I think for me, the, the pursuit that is to try and, not answer that question because I think it's kind of impossible to, especially in this kind of genre bending series that um, we have, but try as an actor, just kind of get as close to an understanding of that as possible. Um, so then that on top of, um, you know, getting the chance to work with um, Michelle and, and Elizabeth and Wagner and Philippa and Amy, um, it's just such a talented group of really smart um, people who know exactly what they're doing and so proficient in the, in their skills that um, I felt like I could kind of test myself a little bit more than usual, kind of walk a tightrope a little bit more than I usually would. And I felt completely protected by this amazing um, team. Um, so all of that combined just kind of made it something that felt um, I wanted to be a part of desperately. So cool. Um, this is kind of open to both of you, but in a narrative like this that jumps around so much, how important is it for you personally to know 
to be super anchored in where you are in the character's trajectory, does it, does it matter? Does, is it something that you need to have kind of in your pocket when you're performing? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it always matters and it definitely mattered uh, a lot more when you're dealing with time travel. Um, it was a lot more complicated to track. It was a lot more complicated to just literally, this is so, this is so boring, but just literally keep track of what your character knows and what your character doesn't know yet, right? Um, which is a basic part of an actor's job and that's like what you're supposed to do, but this is on another level. And then obviously shooting almost all the episodes at the same time and then shooting them all out of order just added this this other layer. But I, I think the thing that was always, again, so important to us though, was that as long as you were grounded in the character's emotional experience, you were, the scene would work. And those are my favorite scenes in the show, the scenes where these, these two characters or other characters are really grounded in an emotional story. And there might be crazy things happening around them or things, they might be talking about this or that with the other thing, but you know, the emotion behind it is what is, is what I get interested in, in watching, you know, and I mean, just speaking to, to Jamie's character, Harper, he, you know, he, what I felt like Jamie brought to this and then talk about you, why you're, why you're there, Jamie, I'm sorry, yeah, but <laughs> just turn away. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I felt like he brought to this, like he just said, trying to understand this person. I mean, that statement alone shows what kind of an actor Jamie is and the, the dedication and the amount of work that he brought to this role, because just the desire to get close to understanding, just the desire to try to understand this person is exactly why Harper, his Harper is so good and so interesting to watch. And it was so important to us to not have a mustache twirling villain. That was not what we wanted. You know, we really wanted somebody who you would believe if you sat next to him in a bar or, or met him on the street that one of these women would have talked to him and not been threatened. Uh, and that was so important. And Jamie brought this humanity to that, to that role that I don't think the show would have worked without his performance. And that's what I think is we were all trying to do to kind of a uh, long-winded answer to your question. We were all trying to, constantly ground these characters so that um, no matter what was happening around them, as confusing as it might get, you were able to latch on to the emotion of the scene. Just real quick as a sidebar, I did love that scene where they, they're meeting, I think um, Kirby, before she was Kirby, is pending bar and they're having just a conversation at a bar that is like, yeah. Like you would talk to anyone and it's like, oh, without all this baggage that we know about both of them, this, this, he's a very charming man and she's chatting with him. Exactly. And there's almost this chemistry between them. And like she kind of like wins their little art, art, little spat. And it's it's kind of fun. And, and you're like, yes, and you can't do that with another. Jamie brings that. You, that is so hard to do. But I got to say, I mean, this is going to possibly thank you, by the way, for saying all those nice things. I'll pay you later. <laughs> okay. um, uh, but, uh, but the other thing is, like, if I this might sound like a garbage answer, but the truth is like, I never particularly felt kind of anchored to who he was at any one moment. I think that on, on something like this, it was kind of every episode of like, oh, maybe he's kind of more like this kind of person. And then the character kind of moved slightly to the right. And then, and then I was like, oh, he's like fully delusional. He lives in a, in a, in a, in a, a alternative world where he's in, he's, having these experiences with his own narrative that is completely separate from his victims. So then that kind of came up. So it was, you know, as, and as an actor and, and as someone who doesn't particularly love reviewing the work or like looking back on it or anything like that, because, because of this reason is, is that I always want to go back to the beginning and start again. <laughs> oh, I would much rather just like go up, do the whole season and go like, oh, now I fully know who he is. Let's do day one again. Let's just start from the beginning, <laughs> which is completely <laughs> impossible, of course. But um. Uh, I, I tried to get myself open as, as possible to never really having an authority, but kind of just trying to discover more about him as we went. And I, and I, uh, and was very grateful to kind of that things just kind of kept coming in and we could use those things. 
So cool. I picture both of you having like Kirby style notebooks like today. <laughs> this is what this is my reality for today. And this is what I'm going to play today. Um, I, uh, there's so much talked about how the, your two characters are linked kind of in a way that neither can escape, even if they want to. And um, Elizabeth, the the re-traumatization of Kirby that we see kind of from day one when we when we meet her, it, it just makes me think so much of, of victims of actual crime and how it's not just the crime that happens to them, right? It's the police not believing them and it's like justice not being done. I'm wondering, I think one of the things that you do really well in this series is play that weariness without playing her being completely despondent. Talk to me about finding that line and also tell me if I'm full of it and I'm completely off. No, no, not at all. Thank you. Um, no, I think that was a really fine line to walk, right? Because <clears throat> we wanted her to have an arc. We needed her to start out in one place and end up in another and where she was going to end up was a place of confidence and strength and she was going to sort of find her voice and find her anger and be able to go after this guy and be able to fix this part of her life and stop her reality from changing so we needed her to start somewhere else but you also have somebody that is the the narrator of the show that's the the heroine of the show and you want the audience to want to watch her. <laughs> so you can't just have her sitting in a room, you know, all week long journaling. It's not very interesting to watch. She does have to, it was really, that we had to be really kind of careful about making sure that she, in those first, especially the first episode, but also the second episode is withdrawn, but always looking out, always looking up, always looking around her. So that's the balance that we found was, she wants to fade into the walls, but she's always watching. So I chose to get technical. Like I chose to not play always looking down. I chose to play, my eyes were always up and always watching. So even if I was closed off physically and emotionally, she's always looking for him. That was it. She was always looking for him. Any, every man on the street that she passed could be him. And I was so fascinated by the idea in, um, it's a very dark idea, but I was fascinated by the idea that you had been attacked like that and didn't know what he looked like and how you would just look at every single man and wonder if that was him. And that's, that was, um, anyways, does that answer your question? I think it does at all. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Okay. Definitely. Um, and, uh, and Jeannie, way, I, I, I would also watch a, a series of you just sitting in a room journaling. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what? I have an announcement to make. <laughs> Six hours coming, coming to you on. I picture, I picture it like the Yule log at Christmas. You know, you just like put it on. Your <laughs> just watch Elizabeth's journal for a few hours. Oh my God. Yes, do it. Um, <laughs> uh, Jamie, talk to me. On the other hand, I feel like Harper, if, if Kirby hadn't kind of gotten her groove back and messed with his life, I feel like he kind of could have gone on happily forever doing what he was doing. Do, what do you think about that? Definitely. I mean, I, I think it speaks to, you know, uh, the kind of behavioral sci science element of, of people like this. I, I think there is something to a compulsion, uh, a desire that they cannot control, um, that, it, uh, that they think in acting out these things gives them the ultimate control. Um, so uh, absolutely not. I mean, if there was no intervention, there's also the question that, you know, obviously I don't want to give any, anything away for people who haven't gotten to the end yet, but obviously in the end, he's kind of, he is kind of put in his place, but only to a certain degree, because one could argue that, you know, most of this stuff stems from his own trauma. That's for me, that's completely my secret to, to the audience. They don't need to know that stuff. Um, but you know, behavioral science wasn't around back in the early 1920s. So no one's really going to be able to figure this out. So is he still going to be this kind of violent person, even though she, he's kind of he's lost the, the power of the house and what power that grants him? But is he going to be able to, to change? I mean, I guess it brings up this kind of idea of is it nature or is it nurture that does this to people? And it's a much larger conversation, of course, but um in my belief is that no, I, I don't think, I, I think if he wasn't stopped, if the house wasn't taken away from him, there's no way he would have stopped. I can't imagine. There is, he, he, he delights in, um, 
in observing people in fear. That's his compulsion. That's the gratification he gets. He, he, he's addicted to it. It's like a drug. Um, he wants to see the fear in that person's eyes and he wants to be able to control the situation. He needs to be um, 10 steps ahead of people. Um, he, because if you take that away from him, what is he really? Um, he's diminished. He is a weak person who believes that the world owes him something. Um, and he, he's an underachiever. He didn't really achieve anything. He's, he has no, he has no output of any goodness into the world. And, um, uh, so therefore he has to, um, compensate by taking away from other people. And that's, that's his kind of MO. So no, I, I think, th I think if Kirby didn't get in there and stop him, he would still be doing it for sure. Talk to me about, if you can both talk to me about the first time that you maybe got to explore it a little bit or set foot on it, the detail must've been exquisite. It was, it was incredible. I think Jamie, you were, you were filming in that set before I, well, you definitely were. Absolutely. It was uh, mostly, a, it was obviously mostly a, a set in studio. Maybe that's not obvious, which it might not be because it looks so amazing, but it was all, the interior was completely a set that was built in, in the studio. And I mean, Jamie, you were there a lot more than I was. So you Yeah, no, I mean, it. it was really, it was because, you know, when you read the book, of course, like you create all these images in your own mind of what the house is, what the house looks like, what it should feel like. Um, and, uh, Obviously, by the time we get there, it looks completely different. So, so I was, I kind of was like adjusting to somebody else's kind of vision. But in my mind, it was so much more desolate than it is in the show. But of course, what the show gets into later on in later episodes is that I'm not the sole proprietor of this house. It's been owned by many people through throughout time. So it's it's kind of been built upon and built upon and built upon. I guess the bedroom is kind of more Harper's area, which does feel more um, just like a void kind of. <laughs> it's like a it's a void into nothing. Like the, the, the curtains are tattered. It's, it just feels dark and empty and cold. And I guess that's what he's like inside. But it was, it was kind of amazing to just take breaks and then to sit on pieces of furniture, which is like, we'd all kind of guess, like, I guess this is seventies from the 1970s. <laughs> I wonder who brought this one back in. Like, is, um, <laughs> does, uh, does uh, Harper have a, a fetish for, um, you know, Danish modern furniture? Is, <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that him bringing this in? Um, but it just informs so much. But I, the thing for Harper is that he's not—he's completely and entirely disinterested in it. He has no interest in, I think, any aesthetic anything. Um, so for me, it was interesting because I, I would just move through the space as if it was my own, but I was completely detached from the, the, the things that were in there. They meant nothing to him. Um, aside from things that, you know, things that could give him monetary value or could impress a woman, let's say, that he has keen interest in. Um, but um, it was, it's interesting because obviously we were inside in a studio and they would pump in that, like that light that like flickers. So it did kind of feel, feel kind of timeless in that. You went in there and you had no idea what time it was outside. So, so it was actually that, that light effect was happening. Yeah, to like you. lights on these massive wheels that would rotate and rotate and rotate and sometimes break down. <laughs> We'd have to fix it <laughs> and then it would rotate, rotate, rotate again. Um, but yeah, it's incredible, uh, incredible idea just from a lighting point of view. Incredibly, again, like Lizzie speaks to, like practical effects was it's brilliant to be around. It's just the magic of filmmaking stuff. I, I'm wondering if you think that uh, Wagner Mora's character, Dan, who um, uh, had Kirby not interacted with him, had Kirby not kind of allied with him, do you think she would have been able to achieve what she achieves by the end, not to spoil anything for anyone? But um, he seems like a galvanizing force in her life. Completely. No, I definitely don't think she would have been able to do what she does in the back half of, of the season. I think she'd be living in, you know, the only city in Florida without a beach, you know, like I, I, I think that that's what she was going to do. I don't think she ever would have given up on the idea of trying to find this man that had done this to her, but she, he is the person who listens to her. He is her ally and he is the only one who she can be honest with and doesn't think she's crazy. Um, which, you know, I think, or, and I know Vogue, I think Vogue thinks this as well, um, that that comes from his own life and who he is and that he has his own experiences with living a double life. He has his own experiences with having secrets and, not being the best version of himself. He has his own addiction problems and, you know, struggles with being a father and all of that. So, you know, that is uh, something that we, he sees in me and he sees this vulnerable person 
in in Kirby. So no, I don't think that she would have gotten anywhere near where she gets at the end of the season with without him. Uh, and kind of, it's not an exact parallel, but I feel like Harper has Clara, who kind of <clears throat> opens him up a little bit. We see a different angle on him through her. Um, Jamie, talk to me a little bit, obviously, about playing opposite Madeline Brewer, who is amazing. Um, but also just like, we do see a different side of him when he's with her. And it's maybe not the side that he wants to project to the world. Yeah, well, I mean, Maddie is incredible. Um, I, you know, obviously Lizzie and her have worked together for many, many years and stuff, but uh, I, I can't imagine coming into a show that's already really up and running and, and everyone's got their groove down and everyone's kind of in the in the groove of their characters and everything and, and having to play such a integral part to to one of the to one of the characters and, and really have to kind of come in hot, you know what I mean, and start and start throwing like fastballs. So and she was fantastic and there was there was so much required of her. She had to speak French, she had to do this in, extraordinary dance carrying this incredibly heavy black cape with the radium and stuff which none of that stuff is easy in fact I think she's doing all of that in one scene dancing speaking French and looking <laughs> uh, so all credit to her like a very difficult thing to come in and do um but yeah I mean the, the relationship between him and Clara is is kind of pivotal to understanding who he is I don't think like you know I, I don't think that just because Clara, in a way, rejects him that that is the catalyst to this kind of behavior. I think this behavior is their period. It just so happens that, you know, for whatever reason, their relationship with them as kids, maybe something happened when they were children that it, this it created this obsession with her. Um, his attachment to her, whilst he he's showing a side of himself that is much more um, vulnerable and, and loving and apparently caring, it's still obsessive. It's still compulsive. It's still addictive. It's still um, incredibly controlling. I think even one of the first things he says to her after she's just done this amazing performance, she's, you know, she says, like, did you know what it was about? And she explains what it was about. And he's like, yeah, I don't think anyone got that. And it, it's, <laughs> it's, he constantly is diminishing, even though or all he wants is to be, he wants her approval. He wants her to love him. Um, and he, and, uh, all he does is diminish and all he does is, um, is criticize and poke. And um, so he kind of really can't help himself, but obviously for the ref in my mind, for the rest of the series, what that, what that meant to him was that he's always chasing that. He's always trying to get Clara to say yes to him mm -hmm. and to get her to love him. So all these, other victims, these other women, he's trying to play out this thing where in the end she just says yes. And of course they never do, um, much to his chagrin. So so in my mind, I kind of went to a place where I was like, oh, if he, maybe he's just, in, he's already have such traumatic um, experiences, horrific things that he's already done, probably really cruel to animals, you know, all the one-on-one -on -one stuff that we kind of understand about these people. But then he's so hung up on this one moment that he's just... Um, He's arrested emotionally in that time, and he's just trying to replay it out over and over and over again. And much like we said before, I don't think he would have stopped that narrative from playing in his head unless Kirby intervenes. Um, I think that's where the, this, the thrill of it comes from. Maybe this time she'll say yes, you know. Yeah. I, I will say for someone born before the turn of the century, he does pick up technology like that, though. Like, the, the man can record like nobody's business. Yeah, he's been with a Polaroid camera. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, I don't know. I was just like the band was born when horses were still pulling things around, and uh, he's he's nailed the the camcorder. So I, yeah, I mean, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's Harper's great. got a lot of time on his hands, though. I mean, it's, it's pretty much just the house and the, and the leaving the house to look at the women, and the rest of the time it's just technology learning. <laughs> Leaves well, a lot of time. Because the show could then also just be peppered with me just kind of going like. Oh, shit, an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Littered with that stuff all over the place. <laughs> Elizabeth, what do you think is the point, or maybe, like, maybe if you can't get one point, but, like, the episode where where Kirby's like, you know what, I might actually, like, there's hope here. Like, I might actually find this person, or, I'm, and once, I, or once I know who it is, I might actually be able to have a little bit of justice served. I think it's at the end of episode five when... Dan believes her about the shifts and um, believes 
her uh, that her reality is changing all the time. And he, she, he is the literally the first person in her life to believe her. And um, so I, I do think when she's standing there in the rain looking at him, that's the moment where she realizes, oh my God, I may, uh, my, my whole life might be different. I might be able to make my life different. Um, so yeah, I think it's very specifically that moment analogous moment where he's like oh I might be in deep trouble here <laughs> yeah I mean I think um I mean I think as, as, I think as soon as he understands that Kirby has survived um and he starts to piece together that you know they're kind of on to him I mean I, th- I definitely think that that he's made a mistake is you know that that one of these women has survived his attack I think it's definitely the, the, the starting point for him but then also you know in the confrontation scene this idea that um that he might not be responsible for shifting people's realities that someone else potentially has control of this incredible power over him I think gets him very concerned I mean that obviously that <laughs> episode five the other thing that you know that the kind of science of it um, which is he cannot spend any time away from this house. Otherwise he is kind of lost in time. He's kind of marooned in time in a sense. That freaks him out too, because he wants, he wants to remain all powerful. So just anything that diminishes his sense of control and power and the idea that Kirby might have some of his own power, that she m- may just be as powerful as, as he is without her even knowing it. You know, in a way, I you know, I think in in episode five, when he when he sees that, there's that shot in the rain where that great shot where it kind of comes around and he's he kind of finally understands that he's affecting Kirby's reality. That also, as much as he's like scared by it, it really excites him because that's exactly what he wants. He wants that chase. He wants the thrill of that chase. Um, so as much as he's kind of, I think that was one thing that we were always talking about in the very beginning, which is like. As as much as he should be unsettled, he should also be like really elated by it too. So it was kind of like balancing the threat, excitement thing always was um, was kind of key. But all those moments I think are nerve wracking for him. But mostly that Kirby's still alive. I think would be the one that scares him the most. I think. You're too. Character- I love what Jamie does in that scene on the balcony um, in five, and what we had talked about was that we, Jamie, remember we had talked about it that it was a love scene, that it was romantic. Mm. Yeah. That that for Harper, this was this was the love scene. This was so romantic, mm-hmm. and um, the original I think cue I had in there was was a very much more even like romantic cue, you know. And I think it confused people because they were like, "How is he thinking this is romantic?" And, right. right. Uh, <laughs> what is going on um but i but you can see it in your face so we didn't need it he's just this this this, he's just elated he's just this smile he's just this is like the greatest thing that this woman is experiencing the same thing and he almost falls in love with her a little bit in that moment it was just so it was beautiful performance what a guy (laughs) (laughs) what a guy What a guy. I'm probably um, Barker's biggest fan. I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> no, it's not good. It's, it's definitely not a good thing. But I want to talk good. about the, uh, the, um, you, the characters, unlike in the book, which gives us a long time be- be- before Harper and Kirby come together, um, you guys got a little knockdown, throw down, elbow throw in brawl um, midway. E- episode four, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, I just love listening to how fight scenes are shot. Like, talk to me about that day. Like, did it, how long did it take? How did you guys go down hard at any point? Stunt doubles obviously were involved at some point, I imagine. Yeah. Was that our first scene together, Jamie? Probably. Yeah, I think so. Probably, right? Yeah. It was was split up because it it was, it was in two locations, wasn't it? Yeah. We did did the fall through the mirror first. And yes. then we went back and shot the top of the scene. So we actually shot the ending first and then came back to the top. Yes, that's right, because they had to change it into the bar and then something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that was I mean, Dana and her DP, Bonnie Elliott, had the unbelievably challenging task of planning that. And it was incredibly complicated just to put the different walls in and change it to the glass and, you know, and then change it to the bar. I mean, that kind of thing is just so complicated again to do that in camera. Um, But we, we had stunt doubles and they did do a lot of the, you know, I think the, the big crash through the glass were, I think was stunt doubles. Right. Um, But I think a lot of the other stuff was us. 
uh, or it would be Jamie with my stunt double and then me with his stunt double. And a lot of repeating the same shot over and over with different people involved in the shot. And then an incredible editing job um, was obviously, obviously done. Those things are like love scenes. They're like, they're not, they're not exciting to film. There's nothing titillating about them. They are very pragmatic. They are about repetition. They are clinical, like, and then you see it all cut together and it's amazing and it's exciting and everyone's done an amazing job, <laughs> but they're not like exciting to shoot. <laughs> Do you remember how long? I think it was a couple of nights, but I think Jamie's right. Like there were a couple of nights that were spread out, um, but it did take a couple of days. Yeah. And, and, but it was, I don't have, the one thing I don't like about this, about season one is I don't have, I don't feel like I had enough with Jamie. I don't feel like Kirby has enough with Harper. And that's just the construct of the season. You just can't have that. Mm -hmm. So it was the, the acting part of the scene that we got to do was such mm -hmm. a, was so much fun. Cause here's this guy that I've been talking about for four episodes that I've been obsessing about mm -hmm. as an actor and a producer and a director for this, like, you know, for all this time. And now I get to act with him. And that was so fun. I could have done that a lot longer. <laughs> Uh, and it, fun. Sorry, go on, go on, go on, go on. I was just gonna say, and it definitely amps up. It doesn't. It doesn't like take any of the air out of the the confrontation that may or may not happen later because it just it just builds upon that. I think. Right. You're talking about the the final confrontation as well. I didn't know how much we wanted to, to yeah, spoil people here, but but uh, but yeah. I mean, I, you would think that maybe keeping it to the end, like you'd be at this, but it. I feel like it just kind of like lit a sparkler under what was already a very, very, very um, tense situation. Yeah, it's true, because you think about, um, Lizzie's right, you know, that, that kind of narrative storytelling with these kinds of characters in this kind of genre, you know, Clarice Starling is in front of James Gunn for one scene, and it's the final scene. So, um, of course, the film's always, been, of course, they have the benefit of having two, because then she's with Hannibal most of the time. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it's true, I think that was always kind of one scene that was like, in my mind, there's, there's always those scenes in a, in, a, in a shooting schedule where you're like flipping through like, fuck, where is it? Like, God, I need, I need to like prepare for this one, you know? Um, but it was always one of those that I had in the back of my mind and knew how important it was for the show because it was a culmination of like, you know, steady tension building, invest investigation um, from Kirby and Dan and that it had to kind of pop off in a way or kind of um, explode in this um, interesting way. Um, I thought it's funny that our DP is called Bonnie Elliott. I just want to address that because I'm Billy Elliott. But it's, I just, I, th I feel like I just can't let that go. I have to. You know. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I think they did an incredible job. There's all these like plastic hanging in the laundromat, which I just thought was really weird. And it kind of blew in the wind. And it was, I just thought the design of the scene was, was fantastic. Um, but, uh, but I was really scared about that scene because I, 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 as Lizzie said, it's just, it was acting opposite her for the first time. You want to make sure you get it right and don't embarrass yourself. Um, Can I just say that I'm the only, am I the only person that hasn't made the Bonnie Elliott, Billy Elliott connection? Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I think I'm the only person. I've like never thought of that before. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you said it, I was like, oh yeah, Billy Elliott, right? And I was like, oh no, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> We talked about it a lot on the uh, on the set. We thought it was very funny. <laughs> I am not in the loop at all, apparently. But, Elizabeth, you uh, you mentioned they don't get a lot of time in season one. Might there be a season two? I know you said you might. You either, you're technic <laughs> technically available, I believe, was the quote that I read. <laughs> I'm tech available. Um, I mean, look, the honest answer is we don't know. The honest answer is that, you know, that I'm not going to lie. Of course, when you do anything in television, there's a, and, and it goes relatively well. The show has been very well reviewed and people have watched it and it's gone. It's gone well. So, of course, people talk about whether or not we should we should do more of it. Um, so, of course, there's those conversations happening. But the honest answer is I, I really don't know right now. It's, a lot of conversations that need to be to be had. I, I personally feel like I do think there's more story there. I really do. I do think there's more. I mean, I feel like I, I know what you mean, Jamie, when you say you get to the end of the season, you want to go back to day one. Like, that's how I feel about not only the character, but the whole show where I'm like, OK, I feel like now we know what we're doing. Can we can we can we go? Can we go back to day one? Um, so, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. 
All right. Well, thank you both so much for your time. Um, on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences, process, and craft with your fellow performers. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.